Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nō mai ki nā manu hira ki te whare wānanga o Waikato uh, o whenua tainui. Welcome here to all the visitors who came in um, from um, our side of the university to, to the University of Waikato on Waikato on, on Tainui land. Uh, nō mai ki ngā kaimahi me ngā tairua o te whare wānanga o Waikato. Warm welcome as well to all the staff and students who came along. Um, haere mai, haere mai, haere mai. Um, it's my great pleasure to, um, to introduce Dr. Ruth Pierce, who's um, giving um, our talk as part of the School of Psychology seminar series today. Uh, Ruth is currently a research fellow at the University of Leeds, uh, where her project is focusing on um, pregnancy experiences of trans men and uh, trans masculine people. And for those of you who are going to the symposium uh, tomorrow, you'll get to hear more about that um, during, during that time, which I'm really looking forward to as well. Um, Ruth um, received a PhD in sociology in 2016 from the University of Warwick, and that looked at different ways that um, transgender um, people's health is looked at in, for example, trans communities or academia or um, activist communities. And I I'm, believe this is going to be the focus of the talk today, and it's also the focus of this excellent book, which I'm a proud owner of one of the copies of, and a shameless plug that Ruth is going to be selling these as well for anybody who is interested. <laughs> and reminds me, you, I actually have to get a signed copy from you, Tom. Oh, thank you. Um, just a heads up, we're recording if you couldn't see that, so when we have questions at the end, if you ask a question, it'll probably be, it might be, your voice might be recorded, we're not getting your heads or anything, so it's just a heads up for you on that. Um, fun fact about Ruth is she's also um, a member of a punk band uh, called Dispute Settlement Mechanism. Uh, you're the singer? I am the shouter. Shouter, I <laughs> um, So, Dispute Settlement Mechanism, um, I recommend checking out their, um, their back catalogues of albums which are available online, and uh, they include First one being um, Dispute Settlement Mechanism album being DSM-1. There's also DSM-2, <laughs> DSM-3, and the most recently recorded live album, DSM-3R. <laughs> um, Ruth is a Rockefeller, uh, received a Rockefeller Foundation grant to be um, going throughout the country to um, explore how trans health is works here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and um, I was very great pleasure to to introduce her here to give the talk on um, looking at who the gender experts are overall. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kiara Koku, I'm really grateful to be here at the University of Waikato, um, so thank you for having me. Um, a quick note before um, my performance. Um, I am going to be talking about uh, transphobia in healthcare, Depending on the examples, I might also touch upon issues of ableism, uh, sexism, and racism. And um, I will probably be discussing uh, issues around suicidality and experiences of suicide close um, to me towards the end of the talk. So that's a kind of content note for this. And I said performance, and that's something I want to raise right at the beginning. And this is something just to reflect on. If gender is a performance, as Judith Butler asserts, then so too is expertise. It's constructed through iterative acts. It is present in how we talk, how we dress, how we carry ourselves. It might not be present in how I'm dressed necessarily, although it would be in a punk space, but it's present in how I'm talking and how I'm discussing things with you. And when I say that expertise is performative or a performance, I don't mean that our knowledge or our skills aren't real, just as Butler isn't trying to claim that our bodies aren't real or our social experiences aren't real. Rather, I'm trying to call into question how some forms of expertise might be more or less legible in different environments and in terms of different power relations, and think through what we might be able to do about that. I also want to ask what counts as a legible performance of expertise, particularly in the context of trans health. So I'm going to begin with something that's often discussed in the context of trans lives, which is going 
right back to the beginning, the idea of the young person and what they might be struggling with or thinking about. And when I think about my earliest memories of someone who is now a trans woman and what really motivated me as a young person, I really wanted to be an expert. And initially, I wanted to be an expert on trains. So here I am as a young child. I loved trains. And I, uh, my parents told me about university. And I was like, well, what do you do at a university? And they said, well, you get to learn about what you might want to be when you grow up, or you might learn about things you're interested in. So I had this imaginary vision as a university as a place where I could learn to be a train driver. Um, as I got older, though, things changed. Things changed in my life. Uh, there were these kind of deep motivations and feelings. I got really into dinosaurs. And so I became the kind of kid who would tell you that the velociraptors in Jurassic Park are actually more similar to a Deinonychus, both in terms of their stature and the body design. And velociraptors are only about that big uh, and look quite different. Um, these days, I would tell you that they're feathered. So I was that kind of child. And it wasn't until my teen years that actually I started thinking about gender. Because it was always present, I could tell those stories if I want to, but it wasn't the only thing in my life. But in my teens, it did start becoming more and more serious to me. The strong feelings of what you could call dysphoria in terms of my body and my social relations. And I thought, what is the answer to this? How can I know why I'm feeling this, why it seems so strong and so important. So I went to university to study a subject I thought would have all the answers, philosophy. Um, <laughs> there are some limits, unfortunately, to the voices and faces present in my undergraduate degree. I genuinely studied uh, the work of all of these people. So that didn't have the answer. Looking to the experts didn't necessarily have the answer. So in the end, I had to become an expert on myself, both in terms of understanding my experiences of gender and in terms of navigating healthcare settings. So I talk about experts because this is something that came up inductively in my research. It's something that I came across time and time again, references to experts. So here's a couple of examples uh, from my research findings. Uh, one's from the Nottingham Centre for Transgender Health website. It's the biggest gender identity clinic in England. And in the UK, we have specialist centres um, with multidisciplinary teams, usually of psychologists, psychiatrists, endocrinologists, um, and specialist nurses working within gender clinics. And they state on their website in relation to real life test, which is a concept I'll come back to, the gender experts at the clinic will need to make sure that you are out and about in your new gender role. And I was fascinated by this concept, the gender expert. Who is the gender expert? How do they get to be the gender expert? I also came across claims to expertise among patients in my research. Um, Steph, and this is a pseudonym, um, as of most uh, of the names of uh, participants, she said uh, to other trans patients in a community discussion group, make sure that you're an expert patient and know exactly what should happen in your appointment. And so that was the expertise of navigating the clinical system. But we see another kind of expertise here, which is more similar to that claimed by the medical authorities from uh, Action for Trans Health, who were a trans activist group. And they said on their website, trans people are experts on our own lives. And we know more about our healthcare needs than National Health Service Management and frequently the doctors who are treating us. They said we need trans people at all levels of decision making regarding our lives and an end to cis non-trans gatekeeping. We need a healthcare system that is based on what we need and not on some psychiatrist's outdated idea of what gender should look like. And of course you've got the claim of expertise both explicitly here and implicitly what we need because they know that's an assertion. So where did all of these quotes come from? I undertook a research project between 2010 and 2017, six years of which was my PhD and then I carried on a little bit afterwards because it's difficult to let go. And this was largely um, an ethnography, this is an immersive 
research method, which involves being involved in a group. Uh, it's often involving what's called participant observation. Um, sometimes it involved interviews. I didn't do any interviews for this piece of research, but I undertook document analysis and also autoethnography, which is where you turn the critical gaze back onto yourself. And I undertook a thematic analysis of my data. And that was obtained largely from various internet groups. I had three primary areas of interest. I looked at community support groups, such as web forums. I looked at activist groups on Facebook and Twitter and blogs and how people were communicating there. And I also looked at news stories that were linked to from these blogs and discussions. So I had an enormous amount of textual data, a lot of it conversations in situ and some of it material where activists were talking about making assertions or claims. And similarly, I looked at national health service websites in the UK. And I was focused primarily on the UK context, although I started to look at the international context as I went on to get an idea of uh, how the UK was situated within wider discourses of histories. And so I can answer any more questions about my methods uh, later if people want to, but I, I did a thematic analysis, which is where you look at the textual material and then identify, um, in my case, discursive themes, um, which came across again and again, one of which was the idea of expertise. Now, I was taking quite a broad approach to Trad's health with this research. In fact, the original idea of the PhD was to get away from specialist gender identity services and look at trans people's general health needs. What happens when a trans person is sniffly like I am today and goes to a doctor? What if a trans person has a broken arm or leg? What if a trans person has cancer, for example? Or wider mental health issues? But one of the things I found is everything kept coming back time and time again to the idea of transition, particularly medical transition from male to female or female to male. And the idea of medical interventions, hormones and surgeries this is what the conversations were primarily about in every site, the community groups, the activist groups, and the professional information, both in terms of stuff presented on um, NHS websites with general guidance for trans people and with guidance for GPs, practitioners, and in the medical literatures. Everything came back to transition. And so I ended up analyzing it more than I originally intended to because I realized this is a research finding this is what discussions of trans health keep coming back to. And there are consequences to this. Uh, one consequence is what a number of research participants described as trans broken arm syndrome. Uh, Naif Payton uh, said it's when healthcare providers assume that all medical issues are a result of a person being trans, everything from mental health problems to yes, broken arms. And here's an account from uh, the Twitter account transdocfailanon. Um, where they reposted messages from trans people who were too afraid to post publicly on Twitter. So they created a Tumblr page where people could send in experiences. And this person said, secondary care refused to treat my mental health problems because I'm attending a gender clinic. The gender clinic won't treat the mental health problems either. The assumption was there's something special or different about trans, which means that mental health providers working outside the gender clinic feel, well, we don't understand trans, we can't tackle the mental health issue. But the gender clinic is set up specifically to deal with transition. So it's not necessarily got a therapeutic environment. The interesting thing is this is all kinds of unexpected consequences. For example, trans people are so used to this, that when a doctor asks a reasonable question about a broken arm, for example, what hormones are you on, which may be relevant, um, to, for example, bone density, then trans people often become distrustful, such that they're so used to being asked irrelevant questions that when there's a relevant question asked, they might assume that it is irrelevant. So in terms of conceptualizing this and thinking about where we got, how we got to this, I looked at the histories and also at the kind of current themes and discussions that were taking place in groups. And I started thinking about ways in which trans was conceptualized. And there's lots of ways in which trans can be conceptualized or understood. Uh, but I looked at two overarching discursive repertoires within people who acknowledge that trans exists. 
So you can also think of things uh, beyond this, such as cisgenderist ideas about what trans is. But in this talk, I'm broadly focusing on these repertoires. And I say repertoires because there are multiple ways I identified in my work in which trans might be understood as a condition or in some form of movement. So when I say condition, I mean the idea that trans is in some way fixed or fixable. It's, it's in place you can define what it is. As a result, it's possibly resolvable. In being defined, you can treat it or cure it, whether that's through some kind of talking therapy or through people who believe that hormones and surgeries and uh, facial hair removal, for example, can help. Trans in this sense is usually also conditional. It needs identification by an expert, because if you have a group of people who are trans and a group of people who are not trans, and you can clearly say who they are and are not, then that is something you can develop expertise in. I also came across lots of ideas of trans as movement, oriented around the idea of continual change, fluidity, creation, world building, often open-ended, but not necessarily. A movement might have an ending place. And it's often rooted in the idea of social movement, as in people coming together and acting politically. And I'm going to unpack both of these with examples. And to do that, I'm going to look at para-relations between trans people and clinicians, but also briefly within trans communities. So I'm focusing today on notions of trans as condition within uh, medical organizations and contexts of people who acknowledge that trans people are real, that trans people exist, and that some trans people may benefit, as I did, from certain medical interventions. And so uh, this can be seen embodied um, in groups such as the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, who produce standards of care for treatment, um, in groups such as the former organization ANSPATH, um, in diagnostic uh, manuals such as the DSM, um, in manuals such as the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, and in books such as this by um, James Barrett, who is the, uh, the lead clinician in the largest gender clinic in the United Kingdom, um, and his book Transsexual and Other Disorders of Gender Identity, which I'll quote from shortly. And all of these work to discursively construct this idea of trans as condition. And in gender clinics in the UK, what this operates through is a form of gatekeeping for care. And many forms of medical require, care require some form of gatekeeping. Um, in trans health contexts, however, there's particular ways in which this works, which has led to debates and also some difficulties in relations between uh, clinicians and community members. So the question is, how does a clinician who's decided that trans is definable, it's something that can be clearly defined, perhaps a reference to the standards of care, perhaps a reference to the DSM, how do you know someone is trans and therefore requiring of treatment? So there were two broad themes I found within the clinical literatures in the UK. Uh, James Barrett argues um, in his book um, that gender identity disorders require collateral history and confirmation. So there's two sides of that. One is a discussion with his patients, and he talks about this in depth. Part of this is about taking a history. Does someone have a history of gendered feelings? Um, what is the rationale for it? But he also talks about what happens when I look at somebody, that they look more male or female. When I think about the person, what pronoun do I have in my brain? Um, so there's collateral history there from the expert, from Barrett in this case. And in terms of um, the confirmation, he believes it's really important that not one, but at least two mental health professionals make this decision, which was in line with the um, WPATH standards of care at the time. There's another way of finding out from clinicians who are perhaps less big on this. So John Arsalus at the Nottingham Centre for Trans Health argues that for an individual to be accepted onto their treatment pathway, they need to socially transition first. So it's a kind of test. It's what's referred to as real life experience or the real life test. And in this case, he's asking patients to change their name and most legal documents to demonstrate that they are ready to transition, to take a big step of moving from one form of gendered embodiment to another. 
Um, and the reason this is referred to as um, the real life experience is the idea that in doing this, you can prove that you're capable of living as a real woman or a real man or being perceived as such. Now, this has some interesting consequences, not just in terms of people's experiences within clinical environments, but also beyond. Now, there's uh, an extensive literature on how gatekeeping processes have caused a lot of trans people a lot of difficulty and pain um, within clinical environments. I think some of this might be discussed tomorrow. So I'm not going to discuss this in depth. It's something that there's um, an extensive discussion on. Um, but I am going to look at, at one of the things it does discursively beyond that. So this is uh, an example of Aidan. He was giving advice to other young transmasculine people in a web forum about uh, transitioning. He was quite early in his transition, but new people would turn up and then people who'd been around there longer would assume the role of some kind of expert um, because they'd had more experience. Um, so what happened was a young person turned up and said, how do I know I'm a trans man? How do I know? And Aidan said, have you had any appointments with gender specialists, psychiatrists or at the gender identity clinic? Their job is to help us question the way we feel and decide what's right for us objectively. So maybe they have better advice than anything I could offer. And that's positioning expertise and objectivity in the gender clinic as a result of the way the gender clinic operates. It assumes expertise, therefore it is assumed to have expertise by many patients. Now the interesting thing about Aidan, because I was doing this research over a period of time, his perception of the gender clinic changed. So he was part of a group of people who all went at the same time. And at the beginning, they were very excited. They swapped stories. Which clinicians are you seeing? Where should I go to in Nottingham? How do I navigate the trams? This is really confusing. And uh, they, they were all quite excited. But with time, they started having problems. So for example, one person found that uh, they hadn't changed their name um, legally, so they were told to wait. One person hadn't come out to their mother. This man was in his 40s, and he said, she's not part of my life, but he was kept off testosterone as a result. Um, there was one person at a different clinic on that forum who described going to uh, the gender clinic and choosing a name, and this was a British Indian person, so he chose an Indian name and was told by the clinician, that name is too gay, you're not allowed to have that name, which is this intersection of homophobia, transphobia, and uh, racism. Uh, so Aidan's perspective kind of shifted. He still wrote advice to people that acknowledged the power, the discursive power, of the gender experts in the clinics, but began to understand it differently. And his, it's quite a subtle example, but it's a good example of the way his writing and perception was shifting. So this was a young trans person who was coming out in school. And he said, I'd recommend getting the doctor to write a note for you about having gender dysphoria. Have you been to a psych who has officially confirmed this? And he was recognizing both the power of the psychiatrist in this instance to provide a confirmation for school, um, but also with the inverted commas, was recognizing in part of the com wider conversation that was taking place here that this person didn't actually necessarily have the power to recognize the gender of the young trans man. And this can also relate to wider issues where um, in the UK still, if you want to change your name on your birth certificate, as is the case in many countries, you need a letter from a gender clinic to confirm uh, your desire to live permanently in your new role until death, to quote the law. Um, another consequence of this is waiting times. Now, there are long waiting times in the UK due to lack of resources, just as is the case here, but I would argue that the waiting times were compounded by the operation of the clinics, by the fact that you need to wait for an appointment and then you need to see at least two people. At Nottingham, when I was doing the research, you needed to see five. Uh, it's now less than that, but some clinics still have many appointments. And that's at least that before a first hormone appointment. Maybe you would be longer if you're a complex case. And often you would need to wait three to six months between an appointment. So uh, between this and the rising number of visible trans people, 
and the lack of resources available due to austerity in the United Kingdom, um, the London uh, Charing Cross Gender Clinic uh, claimed on its website in 2018, so late last year, um, that the number of referrals has now outstripped the number of available first appointments to a factor of two to one. So the gender clinic system as we have it at the moment isn't working. Um, the Exeter Gender Clinic said that their um, waiting time from referral to first appointment is 29 months. But then they said, you can expect to begin treatment from around a 30, 30, further 30 months following your first appointment. The first figure is probably a matter of resourcing. The second figure, not necessarily. That's a wait of around five years for hormone therapy if you're a straightforward case. And so this is why I would argue that you have consequences such as trans broken arm syndrome. You have this concentration of the idea of expertise in the gender clinics. It's recognized in the way the law works. It's recognized in the way trans people within some communities will turn to the gender clinic and, and say these are the people with expertise. And it's no wonder that other clinicians are then saying, well, I don't understand trans. It's complicated, it's specialist, I can't necessarily treat you. And I would argue that this is one of the reasons why we have this idea of transition. Firstly, because it's so difficult for people who want to transition. But secondly, the situating of expertise by law and through discursive um, phenomenon within, within community groups means that the people who are the experts are the ones who manage the transition. And so this is the kind of process we're looking at. Uh, in contrast, ideas of trans of movement have often come out of trans community groups, particularly within the last three decades. And I talk in my work about uh, forms of individual movement and forms of collective movement. And in terms of individual movement, that can consist of a trans person recognising the movement. So historically, in many European and North American countries, there was this expectation that a trans person would firstly either be a trans woman or a trans man if they wanted to transition, and secondly, following transition, they would disappear. The idea is the trans history is something undesirable. Uh, but from the 1990s especially onwards, um, individuals such as Sandy Stone were calling for the um, so-called transsexual to forego passing, and in that way, to recognize that uh, there might be a gender journey. So in the same way that I say I'm a trans woman and I have that history, for me that's about recognizing the movement um, while also recognizing perhaps my relationship with conditions. So I don't regard these as a strict binary. And when I'm talking about individual movement, I'm also thinking about ways in which gender might not have a clear ending in either female or male, a clear outcome. And we can see this, for example, in genderqueer or non-binary genders, or in forms of gender fluidity, where someone's sense of self might shift over time. Now, a lot of these ideas of individual movement are linked to collective movements as well. And so, the idea of the current conceptualization of trans has a lot of roots that go well um, deep into the 20th century and beyond. But in terms of the way we might regard trans or transgender these days as an umbrella term, something that can encapsulates lots of different identities and experiences, this was popularized particularly by Leslie Feinberg, who wrote about the idea of bringing together lots of gender outlaws and thinking about ways in which uh, there might be ways of building a wider idea of trans. And you can see this in groups such um, as gender minorities Aotearoa, who are really trying to think about, OK, what about trans as a collective? What about trans as more than just a, uh, one group of people with one group of medical needs or interests? But what about trans as diverse in terms of not just gender identity, but also culture, personal history? Um, and also race, disability, um, age, and all kinds of factors. So this way we've built trans as this larger thing that brings together lots of different ideas around gender, embodiment, and experience. Now, unfortunately, when you have ideas of condition in a medical narrative and then ideas of movement coming together, this can often cause conflict, particularly when one part of the conversation has more power 
And so I saw this a lot in my research. A lot of the problems were different understandings of what trans was, causing confusion in clinical encounters. Here's an example from Roos. They talked about how in their first consultation, uh, the gatekeeper they saw um, told them that they were a dual role transvestite. And she, and I'm using she and they pronouns because um, she regards herself as a, a non-binary trans woman and uses both. Um, and she said, no, I'm, I'm non-binary, but I'm also a woman. I'm both of these things. And at the time, uh, the clinician was using, um, was using DSM-4 and also ICD-10. And there wasn't a way of accounting for someone turning up and saying, I'm a non-binary trans woman. The best way he could conceptualize it is this is a person who is a man some of the time and a woman some of the time. Um, and Rubes would say, well, it's more complicated. But because she didn't quite fit within these categories, she wasn't able to access treatment for a long time until she then said, well, I'm a straightforward woman and lied to the clinician. Similarly, Joshua um, states, um, I wasn't taken seriously when I asked about wanting to be fertile. And he said, the questions I was faced with at the gender clinic just for saying I have sex with a male was like, oh my God, you can't be trans. So it was ideas here about sex, about acceptable sex, why would a trans man want to have penetrative sex if he thinks he's a man? There's these kind of questions, why would a man want a baby? And these are ideas that have come up a lot also in my current piece of research where we're doing interviews with uh, trans men and non-binary people who have conceived um, and uh, carried to term. And some people have found a lot of support in UK gender clinics because there are shifting discourses and ideas and forms of treatment, but others have found themselves rejected from the clinic or discharged when they um, state that they want to have children or bear children themselves. So there is change happening, as I noted, um, in UK gender clinics. Here's a couple of examples. So on the left, I always have to do this when I've got an audience. I'm like, wait, it's the left, because for me it's the right. On the left, I've got an example from the Gender Identity and Development Service website. They're the primary child and adolescent clinic in Britain. Uh, there's a separate one in Northern Ireland. And they've got examples of trans people on their website who don't fit necessarily into these binary narratives. Um, so Jonah, for example, states, uh, forcing yourself into a traditionally masculine role for the sake of passing can sometimes be as constricting as dysphoria itself. And Adrienne, says, in a way, I got exactly what everyone hopes for out of the gender identity service, to find the you that fits you. So they've got this very prominently on this website, promoting the idea that young people accessing their service can transition in different ways. And the Nottingham Clinic, several of the clinicians, including Christina Richards and Walter Bowman, have worked on this book, Gender Queer and Non-Binary Genders, which is trying to provide a guide um, to medical transition, which can incorporate forms of movement, be that individual movement or the insights of trans social movements. The problem is there's this inherent contradiction in how this is working sometimes. Something I saw a lot was a difference between what some people were saying in their publications or on their websites and how the practice was operating. So I've come across numerous young people feeling that they only got access to treatment through the Gender Identity and Development Service when they presented as more strictly male or more strictly female, or when they got their family's narratives to align perfectly with theirs. Similarly, I came across a number of people at the Nottingham Clinic who felt really constrained um, by some of the way the clinic was trying to manage non-binary transitions, including one person who waited four years after arriving at the service before receiving a referral for chest surgery. And so we've got this kind of potential contradiction in place. And this is why, and I, I have clinicians asking me this from UK gender clinics, why are people mistrustful of us? Why do people lie to us? And any gives a perfect example. In a sense, if you can't know, even if there's variation within clinics, there's variation among practitioners, you can't know how they're going to judge your gender, how they're going to make their expert judgment. So Ellie said, an advice to trans women, in this case a genderqueer trans woman trying to seek treatment, if you have unambiguously female clothes, whatever they are that you are comfortable in, then wear them for the appointment. If you just turn up in a plain t-shirt, plain jeans and white trainers, 
with no makeup or jewellery, there isn't much clue to their gender, is there? A girl absolutely has the right to wear what she wants, but at the appointment, the objective is to make sure they see, as James Barrett states in his book, the female inside that XY body. So my personal view is that one should make it easy for them to do that the second they set eyes on you. Why make it harder on some dumbass principle? As soon as you get home, wear what you like. And so this is the way it's still operating in the UK with this level of mistrust between how the clinicians perceive or understand trans. And this varies, but it's the way in which it builds into a discourse or an expectation or an understanding, um, even if there is variation, and the conversations that are happening within trans communities. Um, and this is why, um, you know, when we're talking about the gender experts at the clinic, there is an assumption of expertise about a person's gender. Someone is expert enough to make a judgment on the gender. And this is why people learn to be expert patients to navigate the system. So I'm going to talk a bit now about ways we can move beyond this, because I think this is unproductive. I'm not interested in discursive battles. I'm not actually interested in uh, saying, oh, you know, trans communities are really angry with clinicians. Like, let's move beyond this. I'm not interested in it more. I'm interested in how we can build something together which is more productive. And so I'm going to turn back to dinosaurs because, as I mentioned earlier, I love dinosaurs. And one of the things I think is quite interesting is the way that new possibilities are uncovered, not just as understanding advances, but as new voices come into the conversation. So in the 19th century, we have these very static ideas of what dinosaurs are based on a limited amount of evidence uh, discovered by a largely upper-class group of white experts uh, living first in England um, and then in North America and Europe. And they had these ideas of dinosaurs as these big lumbering beasts. And just as there were kind of changes with the codification of transsexualism in the 1970s, you had these changes in understanding of dinosaurs as well, what was called the dinosaur renaissance. Though in finding animals, so genuinely it's what it's called. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, they found animals such as Deinonychus and realized that things could be fast, you know, dinosaurs could be... Um, could be rapid, they could move, they could be warm-blooded, they could be more like birds, for example. But even then, there's this limited idea of the conception, certainly of animals like Deinonychus, as, okay, they're a predator, they're going to be running, they're going to be preying, they're going to be attacking. This is a rare image of a Deinonychus without its mouth open, screaming. And so in recent years, again, both with discoveries of feathers in dinosaurs and in terms of thinking about um, how dinosaurs might have behaved, and in terms of input from new people, we started to think again about what dinosaurs could look like. And I find this lovely because it's an example not just of the way that scientific knowledge has advanced, but also in the way that new voices can make a difference. In this case, paleo artists who look at bird behaviour and think, okay, what reasonable guesses can we make about behaviour? And also, of course, Deinonychus would have chicks, you know, and we found dinosaurs and eggs and there were social raising habits. And just as we can now perhaps conceptualise of trans people who can have children, perhaps we can uh, conceptualise a cute little Deinonychus chick. Um, so how has this happened within the context of trans health? In my work, I identify a couple of key groups. Uh, one is activist experts. Following um, Stephen Epstein, who did work on the HIV AIDS epidemic, and he talked about the way groups who were turning up and protesting were also going to academic conferences, training to be clinicians and researchers and learning. And you can also see this in trans groups. Earlier I quote, uh, quoted Action for Trans Health um, here um, with women's strike protesting outside the Department of Health in London. They've also done a lot of work on building pathways, meeting with clinicians, responding to National Health Service consultations. And you can see this internationally. I've become particularly interested recently in how in the UK we often don't think beyond ourselves, and yet changes to, for example, the standards of care or the ICD, which UK activists have used, have been shaped often by international NGOs such as 
um, Gates Global Action for Trans Equality, um, or Southern African Group Gender Dynamics. Another group that's been quite important are so-called insider providers. It's what happens when trans people themselves train to be experts, whether they're researchers such as myself, or whether they're working in healthcare. So I've got some examples here, mostly from the UK, but also an American one. Um, the Callan Lord uh, Center in New York have provided uh, protocols for hormone therapy on the basis of informed consent, which causes a lot of consternation in the UK, but then there's a question of, well, actually, if we have this produced by people with medical experience, what can we create here? I've got an example of Clinic Q, who are a, a trans-run sexual health service in the UK, and also Open Barbers, thinking more holistically about what health is, how it can be conceived. They also have therapy um, operating out of there. It's a non-gendered hair dressing environment. Um, and Electrolysis by Siobhan, trans run electrolysis clinic in Manchester, funded through the actions of Action for Trans Health. In terms of what cis clinicians could maybe offer, and in terms of what trans clinicians also need to be thinking about, uh, there's two really great ideas um, that have come out of attempts to uh, combat racism within healthcare. Um, one is cultural humility, um, which I'm grateful to Danielle Castro, who's an American activist, pointing this to uh, me to this. And it's the idea um, of rather than, uh, you know, there's this idea of cultural competence, you learn about a culture. Cultural humility is the idea where you can't permanently learn. It's a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique. And I was recently reading um, oh, uh, Wihongi, uh, Greek, and Heisenberg's uh, account from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and they're trying to employ the uh, Maori concept of cultural safety and this idea of ensuring that hair is uh, provided in a culturally respectful way and the onus is on healthcare workers to make sure that patients feel able to speak to them about what their needs and experiences are. So I actually feel very positive about all of these developments, but they do have their limitations. And when I'm talking about expertise and being an expert, I found it increasingly difficult as a trans person to navigate this environment recently, particularly at a time of heightened transphobia. In the UK in particular, we have this heavy backlash in the media, particularly with the Gender Recognition Act. And we've also got attacks on trans people um, within healthcare, attempts to push back our healthcare provision. And it's made it increasingly difficult to operate as an academic in this environment because every day I open up the news and I not only see things attacking me, I see words that won't rub out, I see other trans people who are suicidal, I see trans people in my communities who are experiencing a great amount of pain or panic or worry about their experiences. And this can go well beyond um, the kind of obvious stuff that's in the media. Something I experienced um, early in my PhD was the death of a friend um, who was my housemate. And she'd been let down multiple times by a system um, in many ways, like on one sense, like she was trans, so she was more likely to attempt suicide. She also had um, trans broken arm in a sense um, with, she had a condition that was never fully diagnosed. We don't know what it was. Um, but something that was causing her permanent pain, which was often referred to as related to her being trans. And I came downstairs one day to find her body in her room, um, and I you know, rang up and wasn't able to go in and teach, and it hit me really hard. It's one of the reasons my PhD took so long, because I had to recover from this. She's not the only trans person I know who died during my PhD. And I think this is something that goes missing from conversations about how trans people can perhaps become or work as experts in these environments. And that is we're operating in a society where actually this will happen. Trans people will lose their friends. And so I think this is something we need to bear in mind when we're thinking about, for example, university systems where there's increasing casualization, which makes it difficult for people from marginalized backgrounds to get jobs systems whereby if you're more privileged it's easier to deal with the financial hit 
of training. So if we're thinking about trans health, I think we need to be thinking holistically, not just in terms of including a wide variety of voices, not just in terms of thinking about who's present at the table, what kind of systems do we have in place, but also how can we change the wider structures of universities, training programs, the wider environment people are operating in, to acknowledge that some people will face greater difficulties than others. So to finish on a more positive note, yes, I was starting off by intentionally referring to a transphobic trope and playing around with it, but I think it's quite interesting to think about, okay, well, what happens with this idea of transition? Because the idea of the picture of the young child is meant to uh, symbolize the shock, the shock of male to female or female to male, and it's always in these binary terms. And, oh, look, this person is different. But actually, I think it's interesting to think about what stays the same with a person. Uh, what kind of things change? What kind of things are different? Yes, okay, I was uh, raised as a boy and I now live as a woman, but also I've got longer hair and some of it's pink. Uh, my eyesight got worse, but you know what? I still love trains. I'm still the same person. We are complex and contain multitudes. Um, so thank you very, very much. Nya uh, mihi noi. Nui, um, I'm really grateful uh, for you to come here and if anyone wants a book, I'm not making money from them, I'm selling them at the lowest possible price. Uh, so thanks. Thank you so much Ruth for that, um, oh, I should go on the camera, a beautiful <laughs> um, and heartfelt talk but that, that was also uh, very academically robust. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions, so does anybody have any questions for Ruth? Um, thank you, that was really fantastic and um, I look forward to more conversation but just uh, just as a starting point and question really, I love what you're doing with regard to the um, making visible the, the movement and the condition, the trans mm. movement and the trans condition and exploring the tensions that are in that, that's really fantastic and I just wonder whether you want to say anything at this point about um, the sort of the, the movement towards younger and younger people being involved in treatment processes, um, whether you want to say anything about that at all in, in relation to this tension between movement and condition, because I think yeah. what you set up works really well for adults. Yeah. We can say, oh yes, people are, there's a movement happening, there's the chance of political voice, and oh yes, there's pathologisation happening, but that, that's I feel I should say something in part because, um, firstly because I was a trans child, um, so I've had that experience of coming out as it was as a teenager um, and knowing slightly younger than that, um, and secondly because um, I've spent a lot of time interacting with recently with kids who could be described as trans kids. Um, I'm kind of wary about putting the label on kids who aren't describing themselves as trans, um, although the one I'm thinking of now has just started calling himself trans, so fair play to him. Um, and also parents who are kind of trying to manage this complex landscape. So yes, firstly my research was primarily with adults for ethical reasons, however some of them were reflecting on their experiences as young people. I think we're in a, I mean I've read your stuff so my, <laughs> my my response is going to be, in a sense, responding to that. But I think there is a problem with how the children's services are operating and constructed is built on how the adult services have operated. And I think the pathologization is part of the problem. I support recent moves to remove gender identity, well, gender incongruence in childhood from the ICD, for example. I don't think it's useful um, with children. Um, to label their gender in any way as pathological. Um, I support kind of gender affirmation moves, but I think that should be in terms of if a kid wants to dress or live or have a particular name, support that, but also don't create a permanent pathway for them. And I, I think there were some really powerful reflections on that from some people who've been through the Dutch system and said, I wish I'd had more time to explore. But equally, they're saying, well, I'm glad I had access to services. So I'm interested in how we can do both of those at the same time. How we can have um, 
you know, things like blockers and hormones for adolescents who want or need them, but have an environment in which they can feel they don't, that's the pathway they have to go down to if they've socially transitioned. Um, I think it should be something led by the child and we should be thinking about how can we create an environment where the child or adolescent can lead, including leading with uncertainty. And I think there's a lot of fine words about uncertainty and supporting uncertainty from some of the child and adolescent clinics. But when I speak to the young people, I feel like they're saying the clinics are demanding certainty from me. And when they're saying we'll leave space for uncertainty, they often mean if the child is, or adolescent is demanding something, we'll do nothing until we're sure. So those are my, I could talk about this for days. So those are some initial thoughts. Tommy. I just wondered if that's something I was like. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to ask something about the, the birthday and stuff. Yeah. With your research, I missed at the beginning, is there anything in the middle bit where a person who's carrying a child or doesn't come to and experience the loss of a child prior to birth and, you know, and anything around supporting that area that can be can, can I just repeat the question just because uh, Tommy's yeah. voice is quite soft I don't think that came on the mic. Um, so the, the question was around um, what supports are available for um, a, a trans person who is pregnant who may not have been able to make it full term? Mm -hmm. and, and what, if, if any of those experiences have come up? And if those have come up in research? Um, yes. Um, I was going to say I'm talking about pregnancy and childbirth tomorrow, but I won't be touching on that, sadly, due to time limitations. Yes, I've talked to a number of um, trans men and non-binary people who've experienced um, miscarriage. Um, no one who's had an abortion, although we're trying to kind of to get those experiences and to see those experiences. Um, but I can't think of any support structures that exist in the UK or Germany where I've been doing interviews, and certainly not in Bulgaria where I also did an interview. Um, there's some stuff emerging in terms of guidance in the United States and Canada, but a lot of it is from midwifery organisations, so it is focused more on people who are actually giving birth or are about to give birth. Um, so yeah, people had quite traumatic experiences. Um, one person um, had a teen pregnancy and then detransitioned and retransitioned again in his 20s because not only was there no support, he didn't even have any conceptualization that there might be support that could exist for him. He just thought, you know what, I can't do this, I can't do any of this. So that's something I would hope there can be a lot more on. And I'm hoping with our current project, we might be able to work with some professional groups on providing. Um, at least getting some initial guidance around that. So I would love to know if there is any information available for people. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kira, um, I'm trying to frame this question and trying to make it really clear. But my, I'll just get to the point. I wonder what your thoughts are around, um, as we know language is so important, for all of these, for all the folk that are connected. And I wonder what you think about the um, you know, terminology of gender dysphoria. dysphoria. Mm. <laughs> I've struggled with it in my entire um, kind of counseling career. Mm. Yep. And uh, I, yeah, there's something there about working with clients that have really clung to it. They, they, um, the language has been important for them to access. Um, services, I suppose, but also there's this kind of um, uh, paradox, maybe, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I find it pathologizing language very. So I just wonder what your thoughts are and what the language. <clears throat> Yeah, so that question was about um, the importance of language and um, particularly the word gender dysphoria and uh, some of the, the language that's more pathologizing and um, how there are some people who do, um, trans people who do find that really important to themselves, but um, uh, how that might be um, able to be also recognizing the concern about the pathologizing language. So again, I've got more thoughts than I could possibly fit in a, a short answer, but I'll do my best. I think the language of dysphoria can be useful, but there's the in the in the same way like trans or transgender or transsexual are used differently in different environments. Dysphoria, so we've got what we have in the DSM, gender dysphoria, and then we've got how trans people use it to talk about their lives, and those are 
not only two different things, there's a multiple different things. So, uh, for example, there's a really interesting paper that Zoe Davy and Michael Toes have just published in Transgender Health, where they show that the, way, the term gender dysphoria is being used completely differently in medical literatures, like across the literatures, loads of people are using it in different ways. So no one's being consistent about what they mean by gender dysphoria. And then within trans communities too, um, I mean, two really obvious divisions among many is social dysphoria and physical dysphoria. And what I found is like both in this research and my current research, a lot of trans people, dysphoria is a really meaningful term to describe their experience, but they're meaning different things by it. Um, and I, I think there are people who have a more physical embodied experience of dysphoria, and there are people who have a more social experience of dysphoria. I'm gonna talk about this tomorrow, um, with a bit of like, what happens if you're a pregnant man on a desert island? Do you feel bad about your body? And this was brought up by research participants, and some said, um, no, like I could wander around with my hanging chest and like, um, chest feeding my baby all over the place and people would say there goes Will you know chest feeding his baby again um, and other people said I would feel terrible because it's about my relationship with my body and then others said how do I disentangle the two I just don't know um, so I think it's useful because there is a social meaning to dysphoria trans people say it and often trans people will understand um, but it's getting to the point where we say, OK, what do we actually mean by this is probably where we need to go if we need to have a meaningful conversation in that kind of environment. But also, I'm not a therapist. I should also say, with humility, that is the limit of my experience. I'm a sociologist, and so I cannot speak to that experience and your knowledge and skill in that area. All right, it looks like we're um, almost out of time. So. Um Bruce will be hanging around, I believe, to yeah, yeah. sell books, but also to take any further questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy questions. just to chat about stuff. Um, and Ruth's obviously staying around until tomorrow, so you'll see her at the symposium for those of you who are coming. Um, so, um, yeah, without further ado, thank you so much, Ruth, and now Miki Nui. Do we stop this? Oh, they get to have someone saying, do I stop this at the end of the capture, my favourite.